that is associated to that project, you must be able to communicate the objective of the project to them. And then you must be able to procure the required tools, materials that are required for the project. You must be able to procure tools, materials, and the necessary resources that are required for the project as a project manager. You must understand what is required, what is needed to get the project done. And you must also be able to manage the project constraints. Every project has its constraints. As the project as manager, to that project, you must be able to communicate your But you must also be able to inform stakeholders of work progress regularly by means of organizing progress meeting or providing uh, either bi-weekly reports or uh, monthly reports to stakeholders so that they're able to see what is going on in the project. You cannot just leave the project stakeholders in limbo while you're running the project. You need to gradually always update them with the progress of project and you must do that regularly at a patterned regular basis. You must be able to assess monitor and mitigate the game risks that are associated with the project. Every project has its own risks and you must be able to assess the risks, you must be able to monitor the risks and you must be able to mitigate the against this risk. It depends on how the risks affects and um, uh, influence the project. So you must do your risk analysis for the project to know how the, how the risks will impact the project in whatever form or kind. You must be able to adapt to and manage changes as a comes for the project because every project from time to time changes may arise either from the client or from um, uh, the project sponsor or from the, even the project team itself. Uh, but you as a project manager, you must be resolute and able to uh, manage and adapt to uh, the changes that may probably come in the, in the project uh, cycle. You must also be determined, uh, determine and implement the needs of the client. You must be determined to implement the needs of the client. You must ensure that the needs of the client are met as the project manager. So the skills that the project manager needs to be able to uh, achieve a good uh, uh, project, to make a project successful, one of the things that the project need manager requires is conflict um, management skill. The project manager must be a good conflict manager, must be a people manager, must be able to manage people, uh, must uh, I have leadership and must be result oriented. He must always look to resolve problem and must be a creative thinker. The project manager must be a project a problem solver and also must be creative in his thinking to be able to solve projects. Must be able to plan and organize properly. Must be able to manage time very well. Must understand the contract and be able to manage it and must also have good negotiation skills as a project manager. You must have good negotiation skills. Uh, project management procedures. Uh, one of the things that you experience when you are going through project management, there are different um, part of the project that you must understand and know how uh, it goes. And one of the things that you must look at is the purpose of the project. The purpose of the project. You must be able to define what that purpose of the project is. And you also need to look at the different options considered while looking at the project. You need to analyze and see, oh, what are the best ways to run this project? The different methodologies that you need to look at. You must consider the different options for the project. And you must also evaluate uh, the alternate methods of achieving the results in the project. Uh, you must look at the alternate methods and choose the best one that you are suited for to be able to ensure that the project is successful. You must also look at the benefits of the project. What are the benefits of the project? What are the advantages of having the project? What are the advantages of ensuring that the project is, success is successful? You must also look at the possible disadvantages of the project. You must look at the possible disadvantages of the project. To know that either the project will be uh, successful or not, you must weigh the advantages and the disadvantages of the project to be able to understand and know exactly how to achieve the result that you are projected to achieve. You know, when you know the disadvantages of the project, you will know how the project plays the advantages and the, uh, the disadvantages that are associated with the project. So as a project manager, you must understand that and know how to manage it to ensure that the project is successful. You must also be able to appraise the cost and investment uh, that is associated with the project. You must know the cost 
and the investment that is put in there to be able to understand and know the return on investment and manage the return of the investment of the project. You must also be able to summarize the potential risks that are associated with the project. You must be able to summarize the potential risks that are associated with the project to know how to manage this, like I earlier mentioned, to ensure that the project does not have any hiccups. I always, would, would always tell our, our, our members of this class that, um, especially for, for those of us that are domesticated in Nigeria, that in Nigeria there is always rainy season. And any project that you run, is a risk that is given the weather. You cannot just wake up and say, ah, your project is being disturbed by the rain. When you are supposed to, as a project manager, plan for this disruption that may, that may arise from the weather, which is a given, because between the, between the months of March to the months of August, September, is rainy season. And you must be able to adequately plan for it, because it's a risk that may affect your project. You know how to affect your project and how to plan for uh, the, the requisite risks that is associated with it. The project management processes. There's what we call the project management life cycle. Sorry, the project life cycle. That project life cycle includes several steps required for the project manager to successfully manage a project from start to finish. There are five phases of the project life cycle, uh, also called the five process. We have the initiating phase, we have the planning phase, we have the executing phase, we have the monitoring and control, and also we have the closing phase. Uh, this, this, this project um, uh, management uh, process falls into these five groups. And every project normally goes through this life cycle. Every project goes through this, um, these five processes. Initiating uh, the project, when the project is battered, and then you go into the planning phase, where the whole strategy and how to achieve the project is done. And then you go into the executing process, is the executing stage, where you actually do the actual work that is needed for the project. And then you have the monitoring and control, which is subsumed most of the times in the execution phase, because you need to monitor and ensure that the project is done within the agreed criteria and the, um, uh, the, the right um, as, um, uh, uh, processes that are supposed to go through. And then the closing phase of the project. I want to say that you must ensure that the, man, the planning phase is very robust. Once you are able to plan very well for a project, you have actually caused the project to uh, succeed. Uh, so the planning, the different phases of the project, uh, the definition and initiation phase are together. You have the planning phase, the execution phase, and the, uh, the, the, the monitoring and control of the project, and then the closing of the project. Project execution which is what a lot of people see as uh, the actual working of the project, not knowing that the project has already started before you get to the project of execution. Okay, Jim, I thought um, that was an issue. Okay. Um, the pro uh, once a project has start, got into the execution phase, it means that you are done with the initiation phase and with the planning phase. And then you are already, uh, if you, you, most of the times when people see the, uh, the, the, the execution phase in active, they feel that that's when the project has started, but that's not correct. The execution phase in the project life cycle is when the work is performed and everything in the project plan is put into action. All the plans that you have put on ground, it is at this stage that you bring it and put it into action. The project scheduling and planning are simply uh, the beginning. Most of the times, the work of a project are during its execution. Therefore, execution in project management is critical and important. Project execution steps. The steps during the project execution will change depending on the specific, specific requirement of the project. Those particular steps are typically laid out in the project execution plan. However, there are general activities that should apply to all projects. Project execution steps. One of the first steps that you must do, you must create the tasks. Every task that is required for that project to be successful, you need to break it down 
like we said earlier on, you must be able to break the tax, the project, to a set of manageable tax. A set of manageable tax. You create the tax that needs to be done. The next thing you allocate timelines uh, to the set of tax uh, that you have created. You now assign tax, um, assign tax to teams. Uh, while you are assigning that those tax to teams, you also also look for team heads for each of the uh, different tasks that you have created. You also create a tracker to track progress. You create tracker to track progress, and you communicate regularly to stakeholders and those that are involved, even amongst your team members. You must also engage with, with uh, stakeholders regularly, and you must ensure that the schedule changes. At least once the, uh, you have a change in schedule, especially when the tasks that you have done are completed, you move to create more tasks and ensure that that cycle just continues to ensure that the project moves towards completion. The project execution phase activities includes beginning the work itself, the active work itself begins then, manage workflow for all project tasks, issue management, that may arise as the uh, that may arise as the project is being uh, 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 being done. You must also also learn to be able to manage risks because, of course, this is when the risks that you have you have you have uh, forecasted or you have uh, planned for begins to come into activity. You must be able to manage the risks and uh, know exactly how to go about it. Manage change orders. Change orders may arise within with any kind of project depending on how you run it. And once the change order has come, you should be able to manage it accordingly. Manage project communication with all stakeholders. As a project manager, you must be in charge of the project communication. You must be sure to communicate to the project stakeholders uh, regularly. You must also verify when milestones are reached. That is, you are supposed to create milestones for the project and know when those milestones have been reached. When the milestones have been reached, it makes it a lot easier for you to be able to identify these milestones and know exactly when they are reached. When they are reached, you need to conduct uh, gateway reviews at, as required. Gateway reviews are determined by you as a project manager. You just put your gate points where you should at each point. When you get to this milestone, you achieve this milestone. You create those milestones as gate points to review your activities to find out if you are making good progress or if you are lagging behind or you need to review the whole process or process, you know whether you need to do a crash program for the project to be able to meet up with time or if you are, you are doing well in terms of time management you know, and to look at it as vis-a-vis -vis the base and the project base to ensure that everything about the project is properly well managed and then you need to report on the project cycle regularly to stakeholders, report on the project cycle regularly to stakeholders the project triangle. Project triangle. This is normally used to analyze difficult difficulties during the project execution. It's used to illustrate the project success. It is also used to analyze project goals. It's used to illustrate the relationship between scope, time, cost, and quality. Uh, that's what you normally call the triple constraint in uh, project management, the scope, time, cost, and quality. Uh, immediately, um, a project contract is signed. It goes into this triangle, the unilateral triangle, which means all the sides are equal. The scope is agreed, the time is agreed, the cost is agreed, and the quality of delivery is agreed. So everybody knows exactly what they are expecting. At any point in time, if any of these elements changes in the project, it will affect the quality of delivery. If any of these items, whether the scope increases or reduces, it will affect the quality, it will affect cost, it will affect time. Any one that is done, if it increases the project time, if you reduce the project time, it will affect cost, it will affect the, the scope. If you increase the cost, it will affect scope, it will affect time, and it also affect the quality of the delivery. Project management structure. Roles and responsibilities defined and accepted. Normally, uh, once as a project manager, you must define the roles and responsibility for everybody. And once they are accepted, it ensures that the project begins to go on. The project key roles include the project sponsor, 
and the project manager. The project manager refers to the project manager and his team, the project sponsor uh, kind of look at uh, the, the, the client and all the associated uh, people that works within the client to ensure that the project is delivered. And also, uh, we now look at the project brief. Project brief is the project plan, must consider the project plan, the risk assessment, project closing. Project barriers. Barriers are things that may hinder the project from being successful. One of the barriers that you must not allow to happen in your project is misunderstanding. When there is misunderstanding amongst your team members, the project will suffer. Poor management. Once you do not have a good management skill, the project will suffer. And also, if you are not able to communicate properly, if you have poor communication associated with the project, the project will suffer. Once you also have personality conflict in the project, where people begin to um, have issues with ego and all that, the project also will suffer. So you must, uh, you must ensure that that doesn't happen in the project you manage. Disagreement also is a very strong issue that normally affects projects. Uh, like what the good book will say, we can two work together without them agreeing. If there's disagreement, the project goes nowhere. The goals and objective not clearly defined, and also bad weather, being discriminatory weather that you have talked about that normally will affect uh, the project. Ensure the following do not occur in your project. One of the things that you must ensure that at the end of the day, as a project manager, it doesn't occur, no matter what you do. One, that the customer expectation are not met. If the customer expectation is not met, it's not good for you as the project manager. You must ensure that you do not exceed the project budget. Try as much as possible not to exceed the project budget. And one way to be able to be sure that the project budget is not exceeded is to ensure that you properly scope the project. Is to ensure that you properly scope the project. You must ensure that the project timeline is not also exceeded. This also properly scoping the project will make you give you who you now be able to adequately plan the time and give good duration for the project, such that both the budget and the timeline are not exceeded. Hence, it is very important for you to note that scoping is important and very is an integral part of project management that for you as a project manager you must take very seriously use use when you are using inconsistent procedure and processes processes that have not been tried processes that are not best uh, what uh, best processes processes that is an unknown it's better you avoid them because it will put you into different issues when it comes to the project because you may not exactly be able to define the outcome the process you are using significant amount of overtime as much as possible you should try to avoid uh, the use of overtime in your project because it has a way of inflating the budget and it also reduces uh, the, the uh it causes fatigue that means the workers so you must try to avoid the use of overtime and also ensure that you do not waste time and resources you do not waste time and resources in the process and uh, unforeseen external and internal events that may want to affect uh, the project. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome to another session of the FM Launch Hour. I'm here every Thursday to share um, interesting topics um, uh, ranging from practical facility management uh, topics uh, to uh, workplace productivity topics to uh, just about everything that you need to excel in your careers and in your life. Um, I'm here every every uh, Thursday by 1 p.m. It's 1 to 2 p.m. Um, make it a date. Um, every topic is going to be very interesting. Uh, just like the one you're going to have today. It's uh, something that, you know, enables people to actually 
adjust their lives, like really, really change uh, people's lives. And I'm excited that I'm having the opportunity to talk about social intelligence into this session. As we get into it, I'm sure you've seen some of the uh, intro that uh, that we play. If you come in earlier than one o'clock, you will get a chance to get a snippet of any of the sessions we've had in our FM Mastercraft Diploma. The one you just saw um, a minute ago is the one uh, taken by architect Osiek Biahe on project management. He's our uh, you know, uh, consultant in, in, in charge of that uh, uh, subject area and is very versed in it. Every week we put a bit of a click from one class or the other before we start the main topic of the day. The FM Mastercraft Diploma is going into its batch 21. Um, the current batch uh, 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 20 uh, has about 70 people who started in, November, in, in February, rather, and they have uh, you know, made uh, great progress towards their qualification with the FM Diploma credential. Uh, by 21, we're looking to have a wider uh, reach um, uh, we intend to also have more international students for a more robust exchange. Uh, so far, the FM Mastercraft alumni has close to a thousand people uh, from about seven different countries. Um, and, and that's uh, building a community that is the largest FM community in the African continent. So if you want to be part of this, uh, with the daily interactions, the daily learning, the daily practical exchanges, um, you need to take the FM Mastercraft Diploma. And that comes with uh, a lifetime of uh, career planning, talent management, coaching and mentorship uh, from me and the consulting team at Maxime Gold. Now, the FM uh, Mastercraft 21 uh, kicks off on May the 6th. Uh, I'll invite you to uh, enroll if you've not yet enrolled. Invite uh, your, your your friends and those in your network to take advantage of it. Um, you 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 are really not too advanced for this course. It's the first of its kind. It's not something comparable to whatever you have done before. Um, people who have been working in FM for years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, they come in and after just two lessons, they are having testimonials of new things they are learning, uh, practical skills, skills, life changes they are making. Uh, career choices they are making because of the things they are learning on the on the FM Mastercraft uh, diploma program. So even if you have masters, PhDs, certifications in FM international certifications and the rest, this one is very different. Don't say you are above it. I've had people who have sent their staff in um, after one or two batches. They've come in themselves, you know, to take the program because um, they've seen the, the kind of difference in those um, staff and the kind of uh, the way they think, the way they are more strategically positioning themselves in, in acting and taking decisions have um, impressed those who send them in the first place. I've had couples, the husband comes in, does it, brings the wife in, the wife does it, comes in, uh, you know, afterwards bring the husband in and and it's changing career. Nobody, nobody successfully completes this program and remains the way they are 12 months after. And nobody who didn't have a job did not get a job within six months after completing it. So th there's really no um, there's really no excuse. There's really no, uh, you know, um, uh, concern that you might be having that we've not taken care of. Many people come into FM from other professions, brand new, no experience, no skills, nothing. Um, they come in and we give them uh, the training for three months. We, we, you know, help them get an internship position where they gain practical experience doing real FM projects for the clients and for the customers uh, for six months. That puts both the certification and practical experience together on your CV at the same time. So you're going to go to an interview and compete with somebody who has 10 years experience in FM and you flood the person easily because you not only have the knowledge and skills, but you now have experience also um, of what you have learned. And that makes a huge difference in your prospect. Um, and many people, when they you know go for uh, their, in their jobs, they get promoted just because um, they now understand how to better align to strategic objectives of the organization. They now understand how to do better analysis and how to think and do things that bring the highest value to the employers and, and to those they work with. Um, so yes, uh, the, the advantages are enormous. Um, we have fantastic uh, installment payment options for those who are still concerned about the cost. I mean, 600,000 sounds like a lot of money, but 
Um, there's no way you won't make that money in one year, you know, on top of what you're currently making right now in just one year. So payback period, you know, most conservatively um, is, is one year and you, you've got that money back and then you earn, you're onto a lifetime of continuous uh, earning. Uh, beyond the FM diploma, for those who have done it, uh, we help you get other qualifications for the FMP and the CFM, you know, uh, at giveaway prizes while also mentoring you to success. And so if you, if you find yourself in, any other career because of what you studied, engineering, uh, surveying, uh, estate, uh, business, you know, and all the others that aren't so uh, uh, defined, you know, like the architects and the doctors and the nurses and the rest, or accountants. Um, if you're not finding fulfillment yet in that path you are in, I can assure you that it takes only 12 months, three months of, 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 of training, six months of practical experience, and then a placement um, and 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 you'll find a career that will be fulfilling. Just come in and see what FM has. It's for everybody. Uh, and I want to particularly encourage those in the engineering uh, professions. Uh, don't while away time. Don't 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 chase shadows in in in, in ponds that are already fished. The FM pond is not yet fished. It's still a green field. It's still the opportunity for you to get ahead of your peers very quickly. If you did facility management today straight from school with an engineering or science or architecture degree, and you uh, you came into facility management, got qualified and got a job in FM, why somebody else chased that same discipline on for another three years? In three to five years time, you'll be any more than enough to pay that person's salary and still have enough um, um, uh, left to, to run your own life uh, from the difference that would have occurred between your career and that person's career. The opportunities are just huge and immense. And every every day, every month, we keep hearing of new opportunities and new vacancies. So don't waste the time. Uh, take that uh, opportunity. Uh, I also want to quickly introduce uh, to all of us, and, and then for the FM Mastercraft, it's promo.facilitymanagementcourses.com. Promo.facilitymanagementcourses.com. Uh, I would ask uh, one of the team members, Max Migo, to please put that on the chat if you are here for the first time. Uh, just go to promote.facilitymanagementcourses.com and read through what we have on that page. Uh, if you have questions, comments, you want to engage with us, we have uh, the FM training uh, forum. It's called uh, the Master Good Facility Management Training Platform on WhatsApp. Uh, the link will also be dropped for you on our various platforms and on this chat. So you can click on it and you know invite yourself to that group. We have a very robust uh, conversation going on in the FM training uh, WhatsApp platform on a daily basis. Mark the date April 20th. April 20th, 2024 is the day we start this year's series of free facility management courses. Um, so we have a whole day of facility management training with certificates holding on April 20th. Now, this is not for those who have taken the free training before because we are doing a repetition of the free training we ran uh, twice or three times last year, uh, twice again this year. So we expect everyone who have not uh, 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 earned the certificate. Maybe you you participated in the training and you didn't, uh, you know, go in on time to the LMS to, uh, you know, uh, take the quiz and, and end your certificate. This may be another opportunity for you. Or you, you know, you tried uh, to take the free training. You couldn't make it on the day. This is another opportunity for you to come and take the free training. Go to freetraining.maxmigo.com. That's the website. Uh, I would also ask that someone in Maxmigo put that on the chat as well freetraining.maxmigo.com. That's the website. Just register your interest there and you get an, uh, uh, an invite um, to attend that session on April 20th. It's going to be hybrid. Some people are going to be virtual. Um, a few who can come into the training center early enough on that day will have one of the 100 seats available in the training center. Everyone else will have to be online on that day. So if you indicate interest in participating, uh, make sure that you are here by nine o'clock and we guarantee you a seat in the hall for the face-to-face -face interaction while everyone else would join virtually. You all have a registration link uh, sent to you to ensure that you are able to register for the training on that day. So those are the uh, 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 prelude to today's uh, session. Uh, it's 10 minutes into the time. I'm going straight into social intelligence, social intelligence. Uh, so that's the topic we're gonna to be looking at today. I know many people, when they hear social intelligence, the topic that comes to mind is also the difference between emotional intelligence and social intelligence because EQ, EQ, emotional intelligence, um, emotional quotient or social quotient 
Um, there are ways of measuring our um, ability to understand ourselves, understand others, and relate to them. So then what is the difference? Emotional intelligence is the ability to identify and manage my own emotions and the emotions of others, right? So how do I, how does my emotion affect the way I react? So the reactions that come out because of the emotions expressed by others, right? So I need to have emotional awareness, my own emotions and others' emotions. Uh, so uh, how, how do I apply it? You know, in problem solving, for example, in critical thinking, uh, in self-control and, and self-discipline. Those are the areas where I, I play, uh, I use my emotional um, uh, intelligence. I try to get to be aware of myself, be aware of how I'm impacting, how those feelings within me is making me um, uh, react to others and the feelings within them. On the other hand, social intelligence, it, it's also very, very close, but a little bit different. Just listen to this. Uh, it developed from the experience with people, uh, how we learn from the success and failures as we interact with people in social settings. All right. So um, what you may call common sense or uh, tact or street smarts, you know, people who have uh, social intelligence, uh, they are able to uh, handle conversations very smoothly. They are able to talk. They are able to uh, use words. They are able to interact in ways that uh, uh, make them likable easily. Okay, um, you are able to play different types of social roles, right? Be able to uh, understand the rule of the game in certain interactions. So when you hear somebody says, "Oh, there are certain social etiquette. There are certain ways to behave." you know, in certain environments, right? It's social in intelligence. Uh, being able to uh, listen and understand what people are saying, being able to analyze what makes people um, a tick, being able to uh, pay attention, you know, just, you know, you, 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 these are psychological reasoning, things that um, it runs in your mind, but the way you play it out, the way you are perceived as you act and interact with people, that's where uh, social intelligence uh, take place to take care of the impression the impression of yourself and how that impression is you know imposed or some um uh, uh place on others so in a nutshell uh emotional intelligence is more focused on your own one's own emotions or reactions why social intelligence is more focused on sensitivity towards the feelings moods and motivations of others and the ability to interact with others so emotional intelligence brings you inwards to ask yourself how am i feeling how is my mood affecting how I'm, I'm, I'm acting and the others um, and so on. And then social intelligence is how am I affecting others? Is One is internally focused, one is externally focused, which is what we're going to be looking at in today's session. Okay, uh, so, so, so don't see it as a complicated term. Uh, it, it's something that we deal with on a daily basis. It helps us navigate uh, better experiences in our social environment uh, at work or at home, you know, wherever we find ourselves. Uh, social intelligence can make us um, present the best of ourselves. So when you hear about first impressions, how you you how you you impress, how you wow uh, people, uh, it comes out of uh, it comes out of uh, social intelligence. Okay. So in, in today's session, uh, as as quickly as we can cover, uh, we want to talk about how to be aware of our own behaviors. Uh, you know, learn to be empathetic, how to uh, think in terms of the next person, uh, the tools for active listening, uh, listening and communication is a key part of social intelligence. Um, and then uh, being able to understand various social cues, you know, there are certain things that are said, there are certain things that are not said, but uh, body movement and, you know, the men or shows, uh, you know, mean something. Uh, you know, whether verbal, paraverbal, non-verbal, uh, they are all part of uh, a social uh, interaction, that network that takes place around us, right? Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, how to learn various uh, forms of body language. Uh, not everything that uh, is it's always said, you know, we, we, we have to engage at some point with things that are not said. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will also change. Um, that's what uh, uh, that's uh, when that 
if you change the way, if, if you change the lens with which you see things, um, it will also uh, mean that what you are seeing is changing, isn't it? So it starts with being aware of our actions and behavior. Many of us are very conscious of the actions and behaviors of those around us. But we are not conscious of the actions and behaviors we um, uh, portray and how it affects others. And, and, and this is and this is you know primarily driven by this concept of self-deception, right? Uh, when we hide something from ourselves or prevent ourselves from accepting something, we try to make uh, ourselves believe whatever we want and alter the fact in our mind. <laughs> you know, this is, this is um, uh, very interesting because um, it's, not very, it's not easy to catch yourself deceiving yourself. It's very difficult. It's one of the uh, hardest uh, skill or traits we can have, okay? Uh, you know, for example, it's easy to think that uh, what I've just done is very good. Like you did a presentation, everybody claps, and then you convince yourself that that's the best presentation ever um, uh, uh, in the world because of what? Because people clap and, and whatever. You, you, you might be deluding yourself if you are covering the fact that you missed out on certain points, uh, if you are covering uh, the fact that you did not pay attention to certain audience uh, uh, questions or cover certain details, you know, you may just cover all of that and say, no, 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 we are, uh, I'm, I'm really the best, you know. One of the simplest ways to prevent this type of deception is to be direct. Always say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't try to deceive with alternative phrases or meanings, right? Uh, uh, for instance, you know, you, 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 your position might have been very good, but um, do not assume it was the best, right? Um, uh, you, you, it, it's good to have confidence from that self-esteem that, you know, uh, I, I like what I did and all that, but be able to uh, find, you know, at, uh, why, why with yourself, not, not others now, be able to identify areas where you could have improved, okay? And then ask for feedback now. Uh, this particular aspect of social intelligence is a bit mixed. Um, it's a bit mixed as far as I'm concerned because you want to ask for feedback, but you want that feedback to come from people uh, who will be honest, right? Uh, too many people around you will give you feedback that matches your self-deception, especially if you are the... Uh, alpha type, if you are the dominant type, right? Uh, people will often, uh, you know, tend to tell you what you want to hear. And that can be a problem for uh, those feedback, right? Um, so uh, you, you have to find a way to filter um, uh, the kind of feedback you get, you know, so that if it's too good to be true, then believe it's too good to be true and ask yourself, uh, what else, you know, um, could have been, right? Especially uh, if people are giving you positive feedback that are so nice and you have that nudging feeling within, you can ask questions. Okay, tell me what um, I need to improve. Ask specific questions to push them um, to, to tell you uh, something that is valuable because I, I, I really can't be at a point where I believe I'm perfect. I believe everything I'm doing is okay. I believe there's nothing I can do to um to improve it you know that can be a a, a, a challenge that can be uh, a challenge because that is the foundation of self-deception i don't want to be like that but again some people give you advice or feedback and you find yourself being defensive like trying to counter the feedback uh, that's also another dangerous uh, that's the other end of the spectrum also very uh, a dangerous uh, position to be don't be defensive or angry um, just because the person delivering the feedback might have said something you don't particularly want to hear. You know, it's, it's often a challenge for, you know, powerful people to hear uh, what they don't, what they didn't think they should be hearing, right? Uh, we must be open to change. Uh, uh, everyone can benefit from change. You know, don't assume that uh, we need for change is negative. Uh, recognize what change is. Uh, it's a chance for improvement. Uh, we 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 act on a daily basis. We think before we act, but then our actions become habits. Uh, habits become characters over time, right? And somehow they begin to set in, you know, right from us. We're growing up, our environment, our interactions, our circumstances. Uh, these uh, actions that becomes habits, that becomes 
character they set in, right? Uh, they become very difficult to change. Your your level of delusion or self-deception is always very, very high. This is normal for almost every uh, body. Very, there are very few people who have the uh, innate ability to catch themselves, deceiving themselves. Okay, so being open to change is a way to adapt to new surroundings and situations and helping us to grow. Uh, that can help us to change our attitudes, uh, help us to build more connection. Because um, if 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 people around you can talk to you and you can take those advice and use it to grow and make the necessary changes, um, they will become more and more creative around you. Um, they won't shut down their brain when it comes to. Uh, 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 what you do, you know, um, whatever the the the, the reason that um, a change comes, or for you to try to uh, adopt a change, it's important to not disregard the importance of that change and turn a blind eye to uh, the prospect. Always ask yourself this question: When a prospect of changing any action or changing any habit hits you, what's the need for me? What's the need for me? If I change it, what will I gain? Sometimes. Um, advice. I mean, this could be a good filter for setting advice and feedback that may not be for you, right? Uh, because some people want you to change, to conform to how they want you to be, right? So, and 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 being able to uh, uh, balance uh, who is giving you feedback, who really wants you to change, so that you can be uh, manageable, you can be malleable, you can be compliant to what they want. Um, if the change they are recommending. Uh, hits you and you ask yourself, what's the need for me? What can I personally uh, benefit from changing, you know, from what I was doing to this way? If I can't find it, I don't I don't, I don't have any reason to make that change, right? Feeling how we see ourselves and the people that surround us can have a positive impact on our attitude and can help build better relationships with our peers, all right? So uh, let me just share a few tips. Um, the first one is what I've given you. Ask yourself, how can this change benefit me? Okay. Uh, don't assume a need for change is negative. Always think about it. Uh, not all change or, uh, you know, a prompt to change something about you is negative. Recognize that change is a chance for improvement. It's often, in, in most cases, um, it's a chance for uh, improvement. Uh, on this part, you need to reflect on your actions, uh, body language, uh, cues that might have, uh, you know, uh, presented you in a different light from what you intended. Sometimes your intentions may not. Okay, so this is how it works. Um, I want to I want to portray a certain impression. I want to say and do things in a certain way. I want to be perceived in a certain way, right? But what is in my mind might be in conflict with what I'm trying to portray. You know how it is where you're trying to be diplomatic, for example. You want to be um, uh, sensitive to the emotions of others. Uh, there might be conflict between what's inside and what is coming out. You're consciously doing that, right? But your body language may give you away. All right? So, uh, you know, it's important that we learn um, how to catch ourselves. Um, uh, when our body language is giving uh, an impression of something different or opposite to what verbally we are expressing, all right? And to do this, we need to be reflective. Uh, being reflective gives us a chance to learn from our experiences, even our mistakes, and recognize a chance for learning opportunities, you know? By reflecting on our actions, we can see firsthand what actions we took, how they played out, and what kind of effect they had on people. Use all of our senses you know, to create an experience in our mind and actions that we took. Just being able to, it's like, it's like playback. It's like playback. What behaviors did you exhibit in this environment? What behavior did you exhibit? Uh, how did you feel? What was the feeling at that time? Uh, how do you feel about it now? What type of reaction did you receive from other people, right? Uh, you know, those are things that, if you just ask some of those questions, you know, what intuitions of God feeling do you feel from the experience? Do you feel as though you've, you've learned anything new from the experience? Just being able to introspect like this is even more powerful than what you get from the external stimuli that people give you in the form of feedback. The great gift of human beings is that we have the power of empathy, Mary Strip. That is one of our greatest interpersonal skills because 
that allows us to have better communication with people around us and increase our understanding of others. Uh, it, 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 um, it, it's the way we put ourselves in the shoes of others. So we, we say empathy is putting ourselves in the shoes of others all the time, but um, it is very difficult to simulate experiences of others so that you can you can put yourself in that simulation when you have not really experienced it. So when you say, uh, uh, "I know how you feel," maybe somebody's crying or, or you know, uh, complaining about something. You say, "Oh, I know how you feel." Don't throw that word out carelessly because to know how the person feels is either you have actually experienced it, that thing has happened to you personally, or you can mentally simulate it for yourself. Put yourself in that same situation and feel it, which is very difficult. Very, very difficult. But one way we can get through uh, such situations and be able to really put our minds into it and create that simulation I'm talking about is to uh, listen. Listen intently. Uh, no distractions. Uh, make eye contact. Eye contact has something it does. It helps you, uh, it brings your mind back to where you are. If you're looking at something else, your thoughts are divided. What you're hearing is one, what you're looking at is different. But if you are looking and listening at the same time in the same direction, you will get a lot more. Nod to show you understand and ask questions. And, and this is something that I always say. You can't tell me that you listened intensely to me when you do not have questions. Think about that. Because if you listen to me and this is all you were doing, then you would definitely have questions to ask. Many people just say, oh, I heard you, I understand. They didn't ask questions, they didn't take notes. Those are the two things I use as my benchmark for knowing whether somebody is going to be able to act on an understanding or just act out of line uh, when I have uh, interactions with you. So when I'm going to be uh, listening to you, I want to ensure that I have a, a means of noting physically, physically. And I want to ensure that I have questions from what you're saying. Uh, questions will be to clarify. Questions will be to confirm. Questions will be to uh, get more information, ask for more details that you might not, not have dropped. Questions will be to uh, ask questions related to underlying intents and thoughts um, around the story I'm listening to and so on and so forth. But you must have questions so that things will be you know, created in such a way that the information you are given is now more uh, holistic. Don't forget that there is an inside person as well that may be entirely different to what you see outwardly. We are who we are. And there's a tendency for us to use our own uh, background, our own uh, mindsets to judge what uh, is being told to us. Don't judge people. You know that our place to judge, that's what we always say, right? But we always are in judgment mode. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, whether you want to admit it or not, you are always judging, subconsciously or consciously. We always judge. Uh, there are certain stereotypes. There are certain, uh, you know, base beliefs. There are certain uh, uh, things, feelings, thoughts, you know, that already is in us. And those things are already always being used to process. You know, when somebody is telling you something, you you are hearing it and you are just processing. You are you are judging. You are. You are concluding, you know, and, and because of that, you will often not have questions because you've made up your mind. You made up your mind that this is what the person said. This is what really happened. Uh, this is the details of what I think is going on. You are seeing something different because you are judging. And that's exactly what I'm trying to get us out, out of our minds. So that's a stereotype that based on anything, anything, tribal stereotypes, um, uh, uh, skin color, racial stereotypes, uh, uh, discipline, engineers that are like this, architects are like that, campus are like this, uh, uh, bosses, so somebody who has money versus somebody who doesn't have money, uh, all kinds of things create stereotypes in our minds. Uh, to become unbiased so that you can, uh, you know, listen with an open mind uh, is what we're talking about. When communicating with another person, Think about how it would feel to be in their shoes and to do the things they have to do, right? Put yourself in others' shoes is really, it's really about trying to feel as if you are them. 
and being able to uh, think of what options you will have if you were in that situation and how you will make that uh, decision. Think about what it would be like to stand in their shoes. Take, for example, in, 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 in a conference room doing a presentation so that by the time you want to give your feedback, uh, you understand exactly what the person actually went through being in front of that uh, uh, audience and, and actually you know presenting something powerful. Something else that we do that is not encouraged is take emotions. It's never a good idea to take emotions or feelings. You forge uh, a fake smile. Uh, oh, I'm so happy for you. Uh, when in your mind you are having envious thoughts at the same time, uh, somehow it comes true. Uh, fakeness is not something that we encourage. Uh, don't be fake. Don't be. Uh, don't 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 don't. Um, whether on the positive or negative side, right? Uh, try to be as original as possible. Sometimes, uh, and this is where social uh, intelligence comes in. Sometimes you may have a thought, you may have a position within you, right? Uh, that is contrary to the general position. And uh, if you throw it out carelessly, it's going to lead to um, social crisis in terms of your relationship with those around you. Instead of taking, pretending something that is opposite to what thoughts and feelings you have, ask yourself, how can I present this? This is my original thought. This is my original feeling. How can I present it in such a way that it will not hurt uh, other people? In such a way that it will bring uh, you know, progressive and forward thinking uh, actions. That's exactly what you need to work through. That's what social intelligence is all about. I want to be discordant. <laughs> I don't want to agree on what is being said. But can I be cordial? Can I be tactful? Can I be uh, careful? Considerate? in my approach to voicing this discordant tune. That's, so, that's basically the core of social intelligence. Okay, One of the uh, uh, most sincere forms of respect is actually listening to what another has to say, Bernard McGill. So active listening is a core aspect of you know, uh, social intelligence. I think most people have this feeling. I do, I do. I must confess, uh, you you barely landed in your comments, and I have a response for you. What was I doing while you were talking? I was planning my response, and my response that I was planning while you were still talking, you are not done, is always always going to be based on my experience, my circumstances, my beliefs, my culture, my stereotypes that are formed in my mind, and that's where uh, we get it wrong with active listening. Okay. Uh, you can learn more about what is being said. You would definitely have questions to ask if you listened actively, right? Um, and if you are doing active listening, you're not going to be just bland or bland, not even blinking, no. There are certain gestures such as smiling, hand gesturing, eye contact and body movement that can signal a connection. It shows that you're actually listening. If somebody is listening to me, I will know the person is listening. Okay. And like I said before, we we we, we hear something a little bit and we flesh it out in our minds. Um, we, we jump into conclusion. You know, uh, it, it it's is the biggest is a biggest challenge with social intelligence. Uh, it's so difficult to ask questions and get the whole information if we already made up our minds um, the way things should be or the way things are, irrespective of what we are hearing. And that happens all the time. In order to actively listen, we must shift the focus of the person speaking and become attuned to what they are saying, all right? Uh, you know, the face, facing the person, uh, the eye contact, we play that again and again, nodding to understand, uh, to show that you really are understanding what is, is being said uh, and then asking relevant questions intermittently, right? Uh, uh, there are certain gestures and mannerisms that you can uh, use to extract more information. Uh, question, uh, comments like, 
okay, I get that. And then what happened next? And then, you know, you are extracting more. Uh, how about this person that was in that event uh, at that time? Was the person participating in this at all? What was he doing? You know, just keep, you know, uh, you know, creating a wider picture, purely 100% uh, focused on the perspective of the person who is uh, uh, sharing the information with you. Uh, don't discount feelings instead of trying to smooth the problem out or over, listen to what the person is saying and offer support. Uh, sometimes we want to fix situations. Somebody has just started telling us a story, maybe a bad news, and we want to, uh, you know, uh, make it feel better. It's not so bad. Uh, it could have been worse, and so on and so forth. Let's be careful how we throw in advice, right? Sometimes um, that's rushed. Uh, oh, come on, that's what's putting you down. Uh, snap off it, you know. Uh, if you've not spent time listening very well um, to see how deeply this person feels about what he's sharing with you, uh, waving it off with your hand and say, oh, that's a little thing. Uh, it could have been worse. Uh, because you are alive now, you are complaining. You know, we could we could really just play it down in the bit to show that we are positive and we are lending support. Mm -mm. This is not good practice. Because often that can become a big problem in itself. That can become a big problem in itself. All right. Because people get that. Okay. So am I crazy? Why am I feeling so deep about something that is sounding so, so minor, so trivial in everybody I tell to? Am I losing it? And when you get somebody to that point, it's as second guessing themselves. That is a dangerous position you put the person. So spend time to understand exactly what the person is trying to say and understand it from the person's standpoint. Give is what the man does, not what he thinks, feels, or believes. Emily Dickinson. Uh, behavior can be a complicated concept. Everyone is different and can interpret behavior differently. Um, behaviors are things that uh, come out of the actions that we take, you know, so when it says uh, an act, you know, leads to a, a certain behavior that leads to a certain uh, character, we might feel that what we are doing, our uh, behavior in certain circumstances or certain uh, 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 environment, is okay. We are doing well, right? Uh, but how does it affect those around us? Um, perception is a very important uh, uh, tool in understanding behavior. It helps us understand how we appear to others and how others' uh, behaviors can influence us. You know, um, uh, you can have a very strong belief in your ability. You are very confident. You are very uh, conscious uh, of yourself. You know what you can achieve. You know how good you are. Uh, but in in um, in displaying or demonstrating that, you may uh, pass yourself off as arrogant and condescending and demeaning to others, right? Uh, so while not trying to, you know, lower your self-worth and your quality uh, or your personality, you also don't want to be seen as um, as uh, putting uh, off-putting uh, to others, right? So uh, that balance between this is me, I'm the king, and uh, how I communicate it to uh, not make others also feel that they are worthless, it's what we're talking about, okay? Um, facts are based on definite results. Emotions are often voluntary and one-sided, but both can affect our behaviors and change how we act towards others. Facts can drive a conversation and allow people to connect on a logical level. Emotions are involved in everything we do, but sometimes they can affect the impact of our behavior and the information we are talking about, all right? Um, so in social situations, emotions can cause facts to become irrelevant. I can even misconstrue the information given. Uh, for example, a male speaker may not be taken seriously at a feminism rally, or a group of teachers may not listen to a group of school board members. When you recognize that emotion may be driving the situation, it's time to reflect on the situation and rediscover the facts of the information. You may have to take the lead and remind everyone to focus on the fact and save the emotions for later. Uh, this is, you know, let's take employer-employee relationship, for example. The fact is, no, no, re no revenue came in. Um, for example, all everybody in the team worked together all month 
and there were no funds to pay all the bills that are due to be paid, right? That's the fact. But what's the emotion from the uh, entrepreneur standpoint? Oh, everybody just wasted my time. Or oh, despite all my investment, I got nothing back. What's the emotion from the employee standpoint? Oh, after all coming to work every day this month, I, I got nothing, right? Uh, somebody's owing me and so on and so forth. Those emotions, uh, they are right in the, you, you know, within the rights of the individuals who are in those, um, who are expressing those emotions. But what is the fact? What exactly happened? Being able to separate facts from emotions is often a difficult um, um, uh, situation we find ourselves and not many people can navigate that, uh, that, that difference. In an ever-growing world of technology, online communication can include emails, instant chats, video calls, text messages. Uh, so we do a lot of these uh, interactions uh, that do not, you know, expose us. Even the one I'm doing now, I'm talking to you, you are seeing me, uh, I'm not seeing you, I see some of you, for example. Uh, you can hide behind, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, telecoms uh, and be part of what I'm doing while I'm not part of what you are doing, for example, right? Uh, so there are, there are different things that can be happening uh, in uh, online communication that we may not be able to fully interpret. But like I said in one of my sessions earlier, there are certain, um, there are certain uh, emotions that come out in the tone and pitch of our voice, the intensity of the speed and uh, intensity and the speed at which we speak, that even if it's just the audio you are hearing from someone out, you know, on 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 the virtual or, or remote call situation, you still get a sense of what's going on, you know. Um, and if you are not if you are not that sensitive, then you need to work more on your emotional intelligence and your social intelligence skills. The man's character may be learned from the objectives, the adjectives in which he habitually use this in conversation with Mark Twain. So communication, the big part of, in fact, communication is the, is the engine that uh, personal uh, communication or social intelligence, uh, people will always, you know, I mean, we talk to ourselves. Uh, in this session and in previous sessions, I've talked about the fact that talking to ourselves may be verbal. Sometimes it may not be verbal. We need to be conscious that Everything is part of that communication. Rule number one, give respect and trust. Treat others' ideas and opinions respectfully with due consideration. This will help build rapport. Uh, you know, just the, just the uh, uh, courtesy you give, you know, when people, you know, throw ideas or uh, exchange uh, thoughts with you will make them more creative and able to come to you next time. Don't be afraid to speak openly with your coworkers. They'll be impressed that you can offer respect and trust so freely and we appreciate the efforts you are making in that direction. Then be consistent in what you say and do because this consistency will help build a familiar base on which to form relationships. Uh, it's important for people to just know that this is your moral standard. This is your uh, basis. This is uh, who you are, right? Uh, so that your actions will be consistent with what you say, you know. The way you you teach and talk should reflect how you do things yourself. Okay. Um, because if you if you say you will meet someone, for example, after lunch to review a report, uh, and 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 then you are not there. Uh, that's that's what that person has in his mind about you. You promise and fail. You volunteer to do something, you know, to 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 research something for the organization and come up with ideas, and then you don't. You see that person who talks often in the meeting, who makes promises, who makes commitments, who who says I'll get everything done. Um, it's one person. It's always talking, always promising. But what do people experience from you? Do they see that you do? what you say, that can be a real defining moment. Make that consistency. It's better to say, no, 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 I can't. My hands are full. Than to say, oh, no problem, no problem. That tomorrow morning I'll be done. When you don't intend to. Sometimes you're, you're making those promises 
unconscious. Some people are just so yes, 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 that they are not even conscious of their resources, their time, and all the things, they, all the other things they have in place before they promise, 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 and then end up being inconsistent with those promises. Uh, always keep your cool. Sometimes uh, things will go out of hand, right? Um, uh, learn from experiences that you know that don't always align to what you expect. Uh, stressful situation uh, can 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 test how you can graciously and gracefully handle situation. If you allow uh, yourself to lose your cool and um, flip and say things that you regret, uh, that can become a very um, uh, uh, sticky situation that you will remember when doing your introspection and ask yourself, you know, why did I uh, go this far? What could I have done differently? Try not to take words personally. People throw words out uh, carelessly. People are, words are cheap, so people can throw them out uh, easily. Uh, don't take them personally. Stop and reflect what was said, not how it was said. Sometimes how it was said can even give you more meaning and be more annoying. Make a note to learn from this experience. Ask yourself if the person had reason for what was said. If so, what can you uh, change? Yeah, you know, learning from that uh, experience. And then, you know, our body languages are difficult to observe. So if, if, if the entire room you are sitting or interacting with people is all made of mirrors, um, I'm sure it would be easy to just, you know, see how you walk, see how you talk, see how your face looks. Um, so, so that's something that um, uh, requires a higher level. Since they are not all made of mirrors, it now requires a, a, a higher level of self-awareness. Um, to observe your own body language, um, which is very important. Most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. Okay. Uh, keep an eye out for these short cues, uh, things that are not being said, things that are, you know, uh, 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 are being implied, uh, you know, the way things should be that have not been uh, expressly stated. Uh, when you are in any environment, be conscious of why you are there, uh, be conscious of what you should be doing to add value to that environment. Uh, and if you are not going to be adding value to that environment, and you cannot define why you are there, uh, you know, ask to be out. I mean, we have so many meetings in organizations where meetings are called, the agendas are not sent out in advance, uh, preparations are not done by everybody that should participate and prepare to uh, contribute. They all come to the meeting and virtually waste everybody's time. As people are just in that meeting, not even they're just sitting there and wondering, "Why am I here?" Right? Uh, uh, I didn't prepare anything. I didn't come with anything. I'm not taking anything they are saying to go and do anything. So why am I even here? <laughs> that can be a big challenge. Ask yourself that question often. And then, of course, uh, not all verbal cues are obvious. You know, uh, a person's eyes will always give them away. Uh, um, we, we say the eyes always, but some people are so good at controlling the eyes these days that uh, uh, they will even use the eyes and the you know, study of this psychological uh, uh, natural uh, you know, symptoms to throw you off. You know, roll their eyes, blink too much, wandering eyes, not looking directly at the person, long blink, create an impression that it's not even right. Um, so while you are uh, reading books and materials on how to uh, detect whatever is going on, what could be underlined uh, based on the eyes and all the other non-verbal cues. Uh, be conscious that um, the, a small aspect of our population that have become good at uh, fooling us, uh, even after we have uh, uh, learned uh, how to, uh, you know, move in this direction or do these things. And then there are, of course, the non-verbal cues, uh, holding the arms. Uh, fidgeting, uh, moving closer or further away. They all have different uh, different meanings. Uh, it's been said that nonverbal communication is the most powerful form of communication. It can expand you know, beyond voice, tone, and even words. It comes from 90% of our communication methods. Uh, I'm sure husbands and wives understand this very well. Uh, there are so many things that are said, not said, that you have to understand, whether you like it or yes. Um, and you have to ask. Um, uh, those of us mothers in the house, 
uh, you still wish that babies or children can respond when you give them those glances, those looks, and they can, you know, a child can write a, an instruction, three a half page instruction, three or four lines or five lines from just the look on the mom's face, you know, at a particular uh, time. Uh, and, and we all have those kind of uh, uh, definitions or meanings we've given to those kind of gestures. It's fine um, as far as we understand and, and use them. As far as you know, uh, in, in that social circle, uh, the meanings um, over time, you become used to it and then you, you comply and, and use them. Uh, when it comes to the verbal cues, this is the one that we easily notice, uh, the tone of voice, uh, the, the pitch, the uh, intensity, the speed. Uh, you know, someone can tell you to calm down, and the calm down can be very annoying, right? Um, so it 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 is the how, not what you say, but how you say it, and that is now more important. Give us a mirror in which everyone shows their image. Um, Jenna Wolf stands. All right. Uh, so uh, a few more social cues um, um, that 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 we should learn. Um, the ability to review what has happened and reflect on it. Sometimes I've jumped to conclusion. Uh, when the full story or the full picture comes out, it don't so mean that I've made a mistake. Uh, but I've said some things that I can't take back, right? Uh, instead of trying to hang on to them or defend them, in a very humble manner, I will need to go back and say, I'm sorry, I didn't have the whole uh, uh, story. I didn't have the full picture uh, when I made those conclusions, right? It's important to always address it so that people don't have that thought or that thinking that what you said, uh, now that the picture, the full picture is out, um, you were not able to humbly uh, 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 withdraw those uh, comments. It's not a good thing to have um, on you. There are times we have to be flexible and adapt to a situation. Perhaps the room contains more people than we are comfortable with, or maybe uh, others are sending cues of boredom or annoyance. Think about what you can do to help the situation. I've seen, you know, someone teaching, uh, some of the school class, everybody are sleeping. It just continues with the lesson, da 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 quoting and doing all kinds of stuff. People are actually snoring so loud that you can hear uh, across the room. And you just continue as if, you know, no, no, no big deal. You must be able to adapt, make some changes. Can we all stand up? Can we all sing one thing? Can we all recite something? Can we all read this together? What, what, one, two, go. There are some things you can do to ginger that uh, um, environment so that you don't, um, uh, you know, uh, look drab, you know, unable to read the mood around you. Because that's poor social intelligence. So just keep talking. Somebody's already sleeping. <laughs> it doesn't add up at all. All right. Um, and then there's this thing about personal space. There's this, there's this thing around us. There's this little space around each person that is personal. You don't, you don't infringe on it. You don't walk into someone at such close proximity when you're not the wife or husband of such a person, right? Uh, it's important that you create a, a bit of distance, you know, an arm's length is, is fair enough. Uh, even if you are working together, always think of that so that you don't uh, jump in and uh, choke people up in the spaces that you work together, each person have their own personal space. And then there's conversation, conversation skills. You know, it's, it's like that adhesive that brings people together, can make friends, create networks, and even seal deals. Uh, you know, sometimes people are just struggling to know what to say. You know, uh, uh, you are in a, in a group, you're in a cocktail, uh, you want to network, and you're, you're just struggling. So, you know, people pick up current affairs, the weather, uh, the environment, you know, uh, the reason we are here, just just pick up things, pick up cues, even from how somebody smiles, so you learn name, you know, ask the name. While you're making contact and asking the name, the person says his name, recite the name again so you can remember and use the name at least one or two, once or twice in making com uh, comments. Uh, it's very important that, uh, that we uh, uh, apply this in our networking and interaction. Because if you go to a place and you pull yourself to a corner, if somebody walks up to you uh, out of pity, uh, you won't be able to take charge of that situation. You won't even be able to, uh, you know, exude the confidence that you need to uh, take advantage of what you have gone there for. So walk up, strike a conversation, 
with just about anybody, uh, just about anything, um, as as uh, provided they are not um, how would I put it? They are not uh, culturally out of place. Uh, for example, walking up to uh, a lady, uh, you know, uh, and uh, saying things that are off color um, as a way of uh, striking a conversation can just lead to who is this rasp person around here. So think about things that can be seen as decent, culturally acceptable in that environment. All right, so that's our social intelligence class. I'm going to stop here. And uh, our launch hour is almost done. Uh, but what I want to do is uh, for today, see if I can take one or two questions. If your hand goes up, uh, you want to ask a question, I will uh, allow you on mute so that I would ask, allow you to uh, ask your question. Um, if you are in the uh, uh, WhatsApp, uh, what Max Migo training WhatsApp group, you can ask your questions there. Uh, I see a two zero three four seven uh, four four seven raise hand. I won't be able to recognize that because that's not a name. I want to be able to have a name. Kindly you change your name on screen. So whatever your name is, and I'll, I'll mute you to speak. Okay, if you can do that quickly, I will let you speak. But I can't. Add, I can't allow a number. Um, you know, coming um, could be a bot or a digital um, uh, obstruction. So please change your name quickly. Uh, so that I can see your name on the screen and, and then um, call you in to speak. Any other person have a question? All right, so Kenny wants to ask a question. So I'm going to unmute for uh, Kenny now. One second. All right, Kenny, you can unmute now. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for. You're welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Kenny. Unmute. Oh, so thank you for all you did. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So I want to ask if the slide will make it available to us. Uh, the slides are in the learning management system. Uh, these are paid training that uh, uh, we share with you the links to purchase the training. They're not expensive. Uh, I use these uh, free sessions to uh, share with you my thoughts about the content, but uh, because they are paid training in our learning management system, I was going to make this uh, available uh, to everyone to purchase a small amount, uh, do the quizzes and pass the uh, test and get your certificates online. Uh, we will not be distributing the slides for the free uh, launch hours uh, um, after we do that. So Kenny, stay on, stay on, 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 on uh, standby for the links to be able to uh, purchase these uh, short courses in our learning management system. Okay, Samuel, on mute. Samuel, please unmute. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Okay, so my question is this. I don't know if I got the thought clearly. You had actually made mention of them, um, perhaps having a conversation with someone and then paying careful attention to the conversation you're having yes. with the person. And then um, in the course of the conversation, you seem to resonate with the person's thoughts, are you at that point coming to a conclusion or judging that converse, as in judging what he is saying, either in a positive direction or in a negative direction? That's question number one. Number okay. two is this. In the course of the conversation, if perhaps because you seem to resonate so well with his thoughts, you don't um, have a question, does that make you not flowing appropriately with the chat? Okay, good. Um, for the second question, my answer is always have a question. Um, always have a question. Always have a question. Just a rule to always have a question. Even if it's uh, a, a, a rephrasing of a comment the person made to say, if I understand you correctly, you are saying that this, this, this. So the person says yes or no, that's not what I'm saying, right? Always have a question. 
uh, for the first question, yes, you will make judgment, right? You will make judgment. But from your statement, it is obvious that you were able to put yourself in the person's shoes, understand the situation from the person's position, and conclude that you and the person, you know, have the same thoughts relative to what is being said. That is fantastic because you were able to experience the person's experience uh, uh, from the way you listened intently. Yes, you, you flow along, you went along, you understood the same thing from the same perspective and you concord. Yes, you're making judgment, but you are making that judgment after you have understood it as if you were in the person's shoes. So that's fantastic. Ayola, you're on mute. All right. Good good afternoon, Mr. Paul. And um, good afternoon, Paul. Um, sorry, I just need my device again. Uh, it's a new device. Okay. So um actually when uh, you were delivering, sir, I I there is a particular colleague that actually came to mind, you know. Uh he was employed as a technician, but actually is an anti person. He knows virtually how to do most things. Mm -hmm. So he was employed alongside with some set of other guys, yeah. which are also technicians. Mm -hmm. So, but I discovered that whenever we ask him to do something, he'll be like, no, I, I should be supervising. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm employed as a supervisor. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I Can you hear me, sir? All right, all right. So, so there was a time there we made an overall for all of the technicians and the housekeepers and all. This guy would say, ah, he, he, he felt reluctant to wear it. Like, no, he's not supposed to wear. So, and um, over the time, whenever a conversation strikes, probably we want to fix um, a, a particular issue. Rather than listening to others, and their contribution to what we are supposed to do, it will be agitating on what he's saying. And at that time, I think all the team started perceiving him somehow because socially, he's trying to like prove that he knows, and it is true. Yeah. I've tested him most times, he knows what he's doing. If, if you ask him to do something, he does it perfectly well, but that attitude of always wanting to show that he knows, made his colleagues started, you know, calling me, reporting him, yeah. and they were not having a good social interaction yeah. with him. They and at the point, you up. Yeah. I remember because, um, probably because I've worked with um, a, cost, a call center before. In fact, the last question, the, best, uh, the first person asked, when, when, you, when you listen, it, you can also ask, just like NTN, if you call um, their customer care, you tell them your name and your problem. They will still retreat. If I hear you correctly, do you mm -hmm. that are you saying so so thing or so that? And you say Big yes, or yes. probably yes. it's not getting you well, you rephrase, yes. you know. Yes. So um this guy, there was a message he sent to me, and it was our boss response to him. We asked him to go and check a particular issue on getting to the site because the site manager does not like him, and he knows that he always wants to prove one thing or the other. The site manager, in a way, did not attend. To him, I did not give him access to check that uh, problem. Yeah. So at a point, sir, he now sent a message to our boss complaining that um, the manager did not allow him to check the fault. Yeah. Yeah. When he sent that message, our boss' response to him was that, um, Taiwo, you complain too much. Another complaint. <laughs> oh, God. I was the only person this guy could call. Because probably he, he gets to know that I understand him That's and I'm trying to yeah. also, you know, yeah. help him in a way, though. Yeah. I Several times I will call him, Taiwo, that thing you said that you don't need to, yeah. I know you know what you're saying, but sometimes yeah. just listen. So he has seen that I always manage him. So when he called me and sent that message directly to me, I said, I don't call him. Then I told him, Taiwo, this is very bad comment from our boss coming directly to you. Yeah. You need to work on this, work on that. So I okay. think socially, is missing it and um, over the time i think my impact on him has actually helped because yeah. uh whenever i complain to me before he reacts he will call me i will now tell him okay do it this way do it that Very way good. and um, 
because he's good and I love what he does and he's still. But because of that social interaction, he was missing out in so many things. They don't even call him. They prefer to call other technicians rather than to call him to do one or two things. So, that so all of these things, I yeah. resonate so well with your lecture today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of my own uh, personal strong, uh, strength when it comes to work and environment so i'm able to understand everybody i work with everybody i deal with both on the uh, higher levels i can relate and interact perfectly so this is a skill and like you said uh it's not automatic we all we, we all can improve you know gradually build it, build on it, build it exactly and um, so that's my contribution also thank to show that i listen to you today thank you thank so much you. well done well done Ayala. welcome and thank you, everyone, for being here. Our lunch hour is spent. Uh, see you again on Thursday for another very interesting topic. Uh, if you have questions, more questions, kindly drop them on the WhatsApp chats on the Max Be Good Facility Management Training uh, WhatsApp uh, 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 group. I respond to all the questions personally. Uh, I think the link is there. Uh, let me see on the chats. Do we have the link for the WhatsApp group on the chat? Uh, yes, it's there. So just go to the chat, click on the link, uh, and, and, and then you join the WhatsApp group. Uh, if you are uh, looking to book yourself or someone you know for the free training coming up April 20th, the link is also there, freetraining.maxmigo.com. And if you know anybody who is still basically thinking that they know facility management, you know, and they've not done the FM Mastercraft, even if they have done master's or PhD, Tell them they're missing it. Let them come and take the FMI Starcraft. Promo.fastismanimecosy.com. Thank you and see you.